Members of the NACA staff, this is my first opportunity to greet you as Deputy Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. It is a very great pleasure to introduce the Administrator of NASA, Dr. T. Keith Glennon. Thank you, Hugh. I'm sure you realize that events have been moving so swiftly here in Washington that I haven't yet been able to visit NACA's research centers and field stations. This I plan to do at the earliest opportunity. But meantime, I very much want to talk with you about our future. First, let me say that I have long been familiar with NACA's traditions and accomplishments. One of the real incentives underlying my acceptance of this job as NASA's first administrator was the knowledge that NACA would be the first and most substantial unit to be absorbed into NASA. Now, during my 11 years with Case Institute of Technology in Cleveland, I came to know many of you from the Lewis Laboratory and was privileged to work with some of you on various civic projects. I've been impressed by the high state of morale at Lewis and by the vigor with which you conduct your activities in the research and development fields. I recognize that you have developed deep and abiding loyalties for your organization. Without such loyalties, there could never have been developed the esprit de corps that has characterized the NACA for so many years and has led to the outstanding accomplishments of the past. It is clear to me that NACA has deserved this kind of allegiance. But now we have come to a new day. NACA is to become part of a new agency, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, established after long months of the most careful and earnest deliberation by the administration and the Congress, you can be justly proud of the fact that your past achievements have made NACA the choice of all governmental agencies out of which to build the new agency. Now, NASA will be different from NACA in many ways. That is inevitable, of course, because in many ways, NASA's job will be different. But, and this is extremely important both to you and to me as individuals and to the success of our mission, NASA must be like NACA in the qualities of strength and character that make an organization great. As you know, Dr. Dryden and I were appointed on August the 8th, and after confirmation by the Senate, we took the oath of office at the White House on August 19th. Both Dr. Dryden and I have had commitments that have required us to be away from Washington much of the time since then. Even so, we have managed to spend many hours working on plans and programs. And I'm glad to report that we have made such good progress that as of the close of business on Tuesday, September the 30th, the shift from NACA to NASA will become official. One way of saying what will happen would be to quote from the legalistic language of the Space Act, where it says, the NACA will cease to exist, and all functions, powers, duties, and obligations, and all real and personal property, personnel, other than the members of the committee, funds and records of that organization shall be transferred to NASA. But my preference is to say it in quite a different way. I like to say, and I believe I'm being very realistic, realistic and very accurate when I do so, that what will happen on September 30th is a sign of metamorphosis, that it is an indication of the changes that will occur as we develop our capacity to handle the bigger job that is ahead. Many of you, I am sure, have read the Space Act. If not, I'd recommend that you read at least the first couple of pages where our mission is clearly stated. We have one of the most challenging assignments that has ever been given to modern man. I'm not going to take time to read the act verbatim, but it does say this about our mission. And I say to you that it is well worth reading, and I'm sure you'll find that copies are available to you. But I should like to tick off a few items of the total mission and among them, one finds these. Expansion of human knowledge about space. 
development and operation of vehicles capable of carrying instruments and man through space. Long-range studies of the benefits of using aeronautical and space activities for peaceful and scientific purposes. Preservation of the role of the United States as a leader in aeronautical and space science and technology. And then, of course, there's the spelling out of what NASA is required to do in accomplishing these objectives. Now, that language is positive. It says we have a mighty big job to do. It says that NASA's scope is much broader and its objectives are much greater than those of NACA. For example, the admittedly vital function of NACA research into the problems of flight will now be only one part of NASA's activities. We will have to broaden and to extend the excellent teamwork relationships we have enjoyed over the years with the military services and with the airplane, missile, and space industry. We will have to add new and extremely able people to our staff. In addition to our own laboratory activities, we will have to administer substantial programs of research and development and procurement with others on a contract basis. We will be spending large amounts of money outside of the agency by contracts with scientific and educational institutions and with industry. We will also be using facilities of the military services, such as the launching pads at Cape Canaveral and Camp Cook, and will be operating satellite tracking stations all around the world. We will have to collect great masses of scientific data and reduce them to useful form. We will be developing and launching into space vehicles needed to obtain scientific data and to explore the solar system. We will be preparing for the day when manned flight goes into space. And that isn't a complete list either, but it will give you an idea of the size and the complexity of our mission. NASA will have about $300 million for its program in fiscal 1959, and with this appropriation, we must press forward the current research programs in our laboratories. We must contract for work by others in such fields as electronics and guidance and other areas where we have neither the special competence nor the facilities that are needed. We must accelerate our development programs. We must acquire the vehicles that will carry our data gathering apparatus and ultimately man into space. As we move forward, we will be building upon half a century of aeronautical research and progress in which NACA has played so important a part. Together, you and I must make our new agency grow and prosper. In doing so, we must have maximum use of the momentum and morale and organization we now have. We must achieve the same high purpose and performance for the all-inclusive aeronautical and space programs of NASA that have characterized NACA throughout its history. Our prospects are both challenging and exciting. I know of no better way of summing up than to quote Senator Lyndon Johnson, chairman of the Special Committee on Space and Astronautics, who said during our August 14th confirmation hearing, and I quote this, there are no blueprints or roadmaps which clearly mark out the course. The limits of the job are no less than the limits of the universe. And those are limits which can be stated but are virtually impossible to describe. In a sense, the course of the new agency can be compared to the voyage of Columbus to the new world. The only difference is that Columbus with his charts drawn entirely from imagination, had a better idea of his destination than we possibly have when we step into outer space. We do know certain things. We want outer space to be a highway to peace and prosperity and not a road to war. We seek a maximum development of all the potentialities and not just a narrow production of new weapons. Thank you very, very much. The next time we talk, I hope it will be face to face.